Hello, and welcome to Wesley United Methodist Church of Trenton, Missouri. Our church is located at 113 East 9th Street, which is on the corner of 9th and Washington in Trenton, Missouri. You can call our office between the hours of 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday through Friday at 660-359-6762, or visit our website at wesleyunitedmethodist.us. Now we invite you to open your heart, mind, and body to the Word of God with Rev. Barry Bulware. When I was identifying what themes within this overall theme, the peace God promises, when I was identifying, well, here are the seven or eight ways we're going to look at the subject of peace, I knew that this would be the last sermon in the whole series. It is controversial. I'm not making it controversial, not in the least. It is Jesus who is making this controversial. He's going to stretch us this morning. And here's the text. It's found in the 10th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus said, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross, interesting word there, isn't it? Who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. May God truly bless the reading of this holy written word. Where's the peace? Where is the peace? I came across something the other day that I want to read for you. It tells us something about the character of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. The people who helped actually be founders of this country. The author wrote, Have you ever wondered about the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence? Five signers were captured by the British as traitors, and they were tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army and had their other sons captured. Nine fought and died from wounds during that war. What kind of men were they? Twenty-four were lawyers and jurists. Eleven were merchants, nine were farmers, men of means and educated, but they signed the Declaration knowing full well that the penalty for doing so could mean death if they were captured. They signed and they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Here the author goes into great detail identifying the specific fate of all of these 56 signers. One man not only lost his wife, but was never able to round up any of his 18 children. Imagine that. The Revolutionary War left all of these men, in one way or another, destitute. And then he wrote these words. Such were the stories and sacrifices of the American Revolution. These were, were not wild-eyed, rebel-rousing ruffians. These were, often the case, soft-spoken men of means and education. They had security, but they valued liberty more. Standing tall, straight, and unwavering, they pledged. For the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, 
our sacred honor. These were among the men and women who gave us America. From giving birth to a child, to founding a nation, from defending the country's freedom to protecting the rights of children, from speaking the truth in a hostile environment to being a whistleblower on a dishonest company, life can be a struggle, not only to make ends meet, but to rise above the fray with your character and your integrity intact. Sometimes you and I might want to raise a fist to heaven and ask our Creator, where's the peace, Lord, in this turbulent world? Where's the peace? Could Jesus have said it any worse? Do we really want these words of His? Do we really need this? When He says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth, for I have come to turn man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Do we really need to hear that? Jesus, did you really have to go that far? Is that how you're going to promote peace? By telling us that you have come not to bring peace to the earth, but a sword that will divide people? Well, the family-oriented Mormons are going to like hearing this one. But then no Christian in any denomination is going to like hearing these words of Jesus. What in the world is going on here? The Prince of Peace, and that's one of the titles over the centuries that the church has given to Jesus. The Prince of Peace has not come to bring peace to the earth. Imagine the selection committee who awards the Nobel Peace Prize. Had Jesus lived today, even that selection committee would have been torn over giving one of their awards to Jesus if he was going to preach this sermon. Was he for peace or was he against peace? Well, let's make things even more confusing. That's what ministers do. They make things confusing, and then they make it worse. <laughs> Isn't Jesus the same man who once said, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer them your left cheek as well? Isn't he the one who also said, pray for your enemies, bless those who persecute you? Isn't this the same man who never retaliated at any point in his life, regardless of what others were saying about him or doing to him? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. And why? Well, the answer is not that difficult to find. Reread Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in either Matthew or Luke, where he commends nonviolence non-retaliation and forgiveness not on the basis of its possible effectiveness not from some silly notion that if we forgive our enemies it is sure to bring out the best in them no but rather because as he would say this is the way of your father in heaven peaceful is the way of God. At the heart of the universe, at the very heart and center of its creator, is not a dog-eat-dog -dog world or a survival of the fittest, struggle, war. At the heart of what the creator created 
something else exists. At the heart of it all is a God who is peaceful, loving, long-suffering, forgiving, gracious. Jesus looks like God because God looks like Jesus. Where peace can begin to look the opposite of peace is at the point of our priorities. Jesus didn't come to turn families upside down. He came bearing a new standard. God comes first. And yes, that is controversial. I am a father. I was in the room when all three kids were born. And one was born by Caesarea. And I was still in that room. I am now fortunately the dad to Ryan. I know what children are and what they mean to us. How they reach the center of our hearts and how we love them with every ounce of our energy. I know what a child means in your arms. And yet Jesus comes bearing a new standard. Even before that child, God comes first. Rearrange the rest of your priorities at your own peril, but put God first. Only then can God help you with the rest of your priorities. The world will always be turbulent in this age, but peace can still find you by putting Jesus first in your life, above family, above friends, above work, above all institutions and desires. Put Christ first. There's not a one of you out there this morning who disagrees with what I'm saying. We all know this is true, that God is a God who wants us to put Him first in our life so that that relationship can impact all the other parts of our lives. We all agree to that. It is doing that that can be so very difficult. Because this world is sinful and it is in chaos. Your one hope for inner peace, what we began with the very first sermon by calling Shalom, is the peace that only the Prince of Peace can give. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. From the beginning of Jesus' life, Jesus was a cause of much violence and bloodshed, though none of it was initiated by Him. You know, during the season of Advent, we hit upon those wonderful themes. We hit upon Joseph and Mary and the angels and the shepherds and the the wise men who come bringing gifts and that starry, starry night in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. It, it's just the greatest story, isn't it? But there's a part of that story that we ministers are so guilty of ignoring, of leaping over in an attempt to kill the newborn king of Israel, the jealous king Herod, put to death all the baby boys in and around Bethlehem. Jesus came to an Israel that was politically and militarily a weakling. It was defeated. It was under the heel of Rome. After his resurrection, one by one, the twelve disciples ran head on to their own violent deaths. Because they had spread the good news of their Lord and Savior. Wars have been fought over the centuries which followed. 
Sometimes, even in the name of the Lord, violence and bloodshed have always been a consequence of the Christian religion. And always a sorry excuse at that. It is only in the book of Revelation where we catch on to God's fullest plan. World peace will continue to be non-existent until Christ returns and eliminates the persuasions of sin and the tempter of all sin. Until then, the only lasting hope for peace is the peace that God can bring to us as individuals. Jesus' peace, the shalom, it is the inner peace that trusts God to provide for our needs, no matter what the circumstances of our life might be. It is not world peace. It is believer's peace. That's a term that I coined, but I think it fits well. It's not world peace that Jesus is coming to bring before his second coming. It is a believer's peace that in spite of how upside down the world is or even our own lives, Jesus can give us a peace within our hearts, within our minds, that we can't find outside of our relationship with Him. Jesus advocated no systemic program of human reform never recommended any collective social schematic, no matter how badly needed or enlightened. Jesus was not even big on ethical codes, had no ideology, did no interesting work in political science or social ethics, and never put forth a plan of action other than the seemingly wildly impractical notions that the first will be last, the last will be first. Plain and simple, if we are to believe that this wandering Jew from Nazareth is Savior of the world, God reconciling the world to God, it is also to disbelieve that anyone or anything else can be in the midst of a turbulent world, this Prince of Peace has every right to say to us, my peace I give to you, but not as the world gives peace. When you and I have tasted the inner peace that only Jesus can give, we will likewise know our assignment. Go be peacemakers. That's your assignment. Among other assignments, for sure. But you're called to be a peacemaker by our witness, by our words, like we discussed last week, by our lifestyle, by our faith, by the congruity of our beliefs and our actions. Other people will want what they see in us, what they have searched for and longed for, yet never found a heart and a mind set at peace. The world is not at peace. Even America was not founded in peace. But believer's peace is available. To say that we are meant to be peacemakers is to acknowledge that nothing can happen through us that has not first happened to us. That we can only be makers of peace after Jesus' peace has found its way to us. So let me close this message. Indeed, let me close this entire series of messages with this prayer, which you will pray in just a few minutes. Dear Lord, send me a surprise, one that catches me off guard and makes me wonder. Send me a resurrection when everything looks dead and buried. 
Send me light when the night seems too long. Send me spring when the cold and frozen season seems endless. Send me a new idea when my mind is empty. Send me a thing to do when I am waiting. Send me a new friend when I feel alone. Send me a future when it looks hopeless. But most of all, send me peace so that I might promote peace with others. For yours is the kingdom unfailing, the power unfaltering, and the glory unending. Now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us on our pre-recorded Sunday morning service. If you would like a copy, you can contact the office at 660-359-6762 or email us at wesleyum at sbcglobal.net. Feel free to visit us in person or online at wesleyunitedmethodist.us where you will always find open hearts, open minds, and open doors. May the blessings of Jesus Christ be upon you in every aspect of your life.